fragrance of the Pleroma. I shall give you what no ear has heard, what no eye has seen, what no hand has touched and what has never occurred to the human mind. It is I who am the light which is above them all. It is I who am the all. Since it has been said that you are my twin and true companion, examine yourself, that you may understand who you are. I am the knowledge of the truth. So while you accompany me, although you do not understand it, you have already come to know, and you will be called the one who knows himself. For whoever has not known himself has known nothing. But whoever has known himself has simultaneously achieved knowledge of the depth of the all. When these words, attributed to Jesus, were first recorded in Greek and Coptic texts, the word for knowledge was gnosis. Those who had knowledge were Gnostics. For some Christians then, Salvation would come through knowledge of a special kind, a knowledge superior to faith. To achieve gnosis was to know one's soul, to know God, and to know the living Jesus. There were people in antiquity who called themselves Gnostics. They said that they were the children of the knowledge of the heart. And that is what Gnosis really is about. It is an intuitive knowledge, imaginative thinking, not analytical thinking, but uh, really uh, knowledge of the heart. humanity has looked for the secret truth of the world and man's place within it, we have debated whether true knowledge and understanding is found only within the self or by the faith we have in our gods through religion. This series traces the tradition of Gnosis, at least as old as Christianity, both a part of the Christian tradition and denounced by the Christians as heresy. The Christian believer expects salvation from God through the faithful acceptance of the gospel, the agnostic has no gnosis or knowledge that there is any salvation or any God at all. But the Gnostic wants to confirm faith with the personal experience of knowledge. By the mid-second century, Gnostics thought they were the true Christians. Throughout the Christian church, their enemies condemned them for offering the challenge of a secret teaching. But little record of their existence survived. Only now, after almost 2,000 years, have their original Gnostic Christian scriptures been found, among them even Gnostic Gospels, recording the words and teaching of Christ. Now, we may consider whether Christianity has ignored and rejected in Gnosticism something of its own heart. The story of Gnostics runs like a pulse beneath the surface history of the whole Christian era. It begins, like other human mysteries, in the deserts on the banks of the Nile, with a discovery. The discovery occurred completely by accident in 1945. The discovery was made by an Arab peasant who lived in a small town near the town of Nag Hammadi in Upper Egypt. And his name, of course, was Muhammad Ali, in fact, Muhammad Ali al-Saman. He and about seven other camel riders were at the foot of the cliff um, digging for fertilizer and lit upon this jar. Muhammad Ali says they, they dug it out and found it was, a, it was a large earthenware jar, about six feet high. When he broke it, he took the th books out, claims he divided th them among the camel drivers, which is one reason that some got ripped apart. You can't divide 13 books into eight parts very readily. And he said he saw gold, you know, pieces of gold floating through the air. But to his great disappointment, it turned out to be simply pieces of ancient papyrus that shattered 
uh, as, as the jar was broken. The 13 books, bound in tooled gazelle leather, contained the so-called Gnostic Gospels, the Gospels of Thomas and Philip, the Gospel of Truth, and the Gospel of the Egyptians, among 52 separate texts of poetry and scripture, now known as the Nag Hammadi Codices. It is the spiritual heritage of Gnostic Christians in Egypt, whose religious ideas were disowned as Christianity developed. The Dutch historian named Gillis Quispel heard about some peculiar discovery of early Christian texts in Egypt. And Quispel uh, got on a plane and went to Cairo. He went to the Coptic Museum in Cairo, and he went there and got photographs of the first of these texts. That was in the uh, fall of 1956. It was a numinous experience to have before you a text that you don't understand at all and bring these characters together and relate them to history. And every time there was Jesus said, Jesus said, Nine and Shatje at Herb and Ta Jesus at Owner Chow, Ao Afsahaisu. And the first thing he read was the words, these are the secret words which the living Jesus spoke, and his twin brother Thomas wrote them down. These are the hidden words which the living Jesus spoke, and Didymus, Judas, Thomas, wrote down. And he said, whosoever will find the meaning of these words will not see death. We here have authentic documents by the Gnostics themselves, uh, not reports about them, as uh, we hitherto had mainly through the church fathers uh, who uh, fought the movement and tried to discredit it. Uh, we have here their authentic voice. To find an unknown Gospel of Thomas among the earliest collection of Christian manuscripts ever found was a unique discovery for Quispel. To their historical interest was added the question whether this Gospel could be a true record of Christ's own words. And then in the back of your mind you have always the idea, can there be an unknown and yet authentic word of Jesus? Because in the almost 2,000 years of Christian tradition, Never a collection of unknown sayings have been discovered. That which you have within you will save you if you bring it forth from yourselves. If you do not bring forth what you have within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. This heaven will pass away, and the one above it will pass away. The dead are not alive, and the living will not die. The discovery of scriptures containing new sayings of Christ threatened to challenge the acceptance of both the Bible itself and of Christian history. The history of Christianity has always been told as though there are Jesus and the disciples, and then people kept amplifying what they said. It, it, it's, a, it's a single stream. It's really almost boring. But now that one has these other texts, we find that the, the early Christian movement was much more multiple, much more pluriform, much more complicated, and, and factions warring against each other, and people disagreeing about either what Jesus said or what he meant or, or what it meant for them. And, and I now find that diversity much more exciting, much more human a picture. Um, and it brings up the questions that occur to anyone who thinks about Christian tradition in a much more vital way. The philosopher Hans Jonas published a study on ancient Gnosticism in the 1930s. The philosophical appeal of Gnosticism was its scandalous radicalism in debating theological matters, disputing the emerging Christian dogma, and developing religious ideas related more to experience than to faith. The Gnostics were perhaps the earliest modern philosophers. Man is always is bound to make attempts to interpret his own being, his own existence, his situation, 
and his relation to the universe of things, how he stands in the totality of things. And this question about first and last things, the beginning and the end, and uh, the uh, nature of the soul, and uh, about good and evil, all this is something which ex somehow exercises the thoughts of man. And here was a case where people went about it in a grand way. They were the first, perhaps, um, uh, who tried to give one universal answer to all this together and bind it together in, in one grand vision. The Gnostics spoke with many voices. That alone infuriated those who called themselves the orthodox or the straight teachers. The Nag Hammadi codices are perhaps little more than a random sample of their ideas, which inherited fragments of pagan, Jewish and Eastern religion. There were texts with names like On the Origin of the World, The Hypostasis of the Archons and The Apocryphon of John. Gnostics asked a timeless theological question. Could a good God create a world of suffering? Their radical answer was a dualistic creation myth and a hierarchy of divine powers, from God down through the ranks of divinity to the lowest level, the Archons, grim angels who rule earthly existence, and the Demiurge, the fashioner or creator of the world. If their principle, as it were, was condensed, concentrated into one figure, the Demiurge, the Demiurge, the creator of this world. And to be the creator of this world is not a title of glory, on the contrary. Look at this world and then you know what to think of its creator. Therefore he cannot be the highest God, because the highest God can, cannot possibly have dotted his hands with creating this prison of the soul, because the world is a prison of the soul. The soul is that part of the higher world which has become entrapped in this work of the lower powers, and that is the distress of our condition. I believed that life was in the first place tragic, but when here and now you had the experience of gnosis, that is, the knowledge of what Christ really means, then you are reconciled with your surrounding and you, always, you also saw that it is really an illusion and that in the deepest of yourself you are one with the infinite, one with the Godhead. Orthodox Christians and Jews take it as a primary theme, right, that God is different from humankind, that God is the creator and we are his creatures. And the two are, you know, enormously separate. Um, Gnostic Christians and Jews will claim on the contrary that there is a very deep identity, not that we are in some trivial way God, but that, that the deepest source of human nature when one, when one discovers it, if we ever discover it at a very deep level, is the divine within us. For an, for an Orthodox Jew or Christian to say that is blasphemy. The Nag Hammadi find included prayers such as thunder, perfect mind, a fragment of Plato's Republic, a hermetic philosophical tract, the discourse on the eighth and ninth, the gospels of Philip and Thomas, the Gospel of the Egyptians, a work of esoteric mythology, and the Gospel of Truth, a poetic meditation on personal religious experience. It described the situation of man as a nightmare, as a bad dream that he is trying to murder other people and his hands are full of blood, or they are at the pursuit of himself and he can't escape until he receives noses. That description of the nightmare is absolutely wonderful and describes the situation of man in a tragic world. And then on the other hand, there is the image in the same Gospel of Truth of man as a montaneer who has lost his way and is in the fog 
And then there's nowhere to go, whether, he, whether to go, when she comes. And then he hears his name called. And then he knows, oh, I have to go there. So Gnosis, a Gnostic, is a man who knows, who realizes what he is, when she comes, and whether he goes. Whereas the Orthodox Christian prays to God, the Gnostic is led towards Gnosis in an imagined dialogue with the living Jesus. What we speculate is that the Gnostic Christian is sitting there with the saying of Jesus, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, you know. And, and then meditating, praying, whatever. And this internal dialogue on the saying becomes that person's dialogue with the Savior. They seem to have a lot of stock in claiming that they have from Jesus and Paul authentic teachings. On the other hand, they're, they're, they believe that inventing one's own is evidence of gnosis. The Gospel of Thomas contains a sequence of the sayings of Jesus. The Gospel of Philip is an essay on Gnostic liberation from the world of tragedy. In the book of Thomas the Contender, the same theme is expressed in words attributed to Jesus himself. Truly, as for those blind, miserable mortals, do not esteem them as men, but regard them as beasts. For just as beasts devour one another, so also men of this sort devour one another. Businessmen and merchants will not enter the places of my father. They are deprived the kingdom, since they love the sweetness of the fire, and are the servants of death, and rush to the works of corruption. They fulfill the lust of their fathers, and they rejoice over the concern for this life with madness and derangement. Some pursue this derangement without realizing their madness, thinking that they are wise. They are beguiled by the beauty of the body as if it would not perish. They are frenetic. Their thought is occupied with their deeds. But it is the fire that will burn them. Gnosis means knowledge, and it's of course a secret knowledge. It is a knowledge of how to extricate oneself from this world. Whoever has come to understand the world has found a corpse. And whoever has found a corpse is superior to the world. If the flesh came into being because spirit, it is a wonder. But if spirit came into being because of the body, it is a wonder of wonders. Indeed, I am amazed at how this great wealth has made its home in this poverty. Gospel of Thomas, uh, Jesus says to Thomas um, that when he comes to know who he really is, he will discover that he is identical with Christ and that he and, and Jesus are, if you like, identical twins. And therefore that saying that Thomas is Jesus' twin brother is this kind of metaphor, I believe. I don't think they ever meant it literally, but rather that you know, you, the reader, <laughs> or you, the, the, the hearer of this gospel, are meant to understand yourself as Jesus' twin brother. Since it has been said that you are my twin and true companion, examine yourself. Examine yourself. Examine yourself you may understand who you are. And you will be called the one who knows himself. For whoever has not known himself has known nothing. But whoever has known himself has simultaneously achieved knowledge of the depth of the all. was of the spiritual essence of Gnosis to reject the rigid foundation upon which a church was being built. Such opposition grew more dangerous as the Coptic church grew in Egypt and Christianity extended across the Mediterranean, despite the persecution of the Roman Empire. 
the rejection of Gnosticism by the Orthodox is as automatic today as in the fourth century. We have only Christian beliefs, which replaced everything. Uh, every belief or dogma which formed a contradiction with Christianity, it was cancelled, of course. The Orthodox gained salvation through faith in the sacraments, in the Bible, and in the Church. The Gnostic gets salvation through inner experience. Examine yourself. PTR 0365 Gnostics Program 1, Part 2, Take 1. Okay. 10 seconds. You are a famous man now, sir. You are a famous man now, sir. You are a famous man now, sir. And you will be more famous now because this film will be shown in Europe and in America. It is now 42 years since Muhammad Ali's accidental discovery of the oldest whole Christian texts that have ever been found. Only now is the impact of that discovery being felt. After more than 30 years of scholarly work on the Nag Hammadi Codices, Professor Gillis Quispel last year finally made his own pilgrimage to the Jabal al-Tarif. He was retracing the steps of modern archaeologists and 4th century monks to the hiding place they chose for their heretical scriptures. They were discovered on the flank of a cliff. There is a very large boulder that fell off at some time and broke when it impacted. And on the east side of that boulder is where the discoverer pointed out to me he was digging for fertilizer and lit upon the jar. He came and with his mattock broke the jar and got out the books and took them home three or four miles away. The village of Alcazar, four miles from the Jabal al-Tarif, is home to Muhammad Ali al-Saman and his clan. Since 1945, the village has been embroiled in a blood feud with a neighboring clan. By 1986, Professor Quispel was doubtful that he would find Muhammad Ali alive, a man of almost 70 who was at the center of the bitter feud. And local illiteracy meant that Ali was hard to trace. But Quispel discovered the penniless camel driver who found the Nag Hammadi codices and listened to his own story. <laughs> I was digging for sabah, for fertilizer, with my pickaxe, and carrying it back to the fields on the camel. Then I came across this big earthenware pot, which was buried in the sand. I had a feeling that there might be something inside. He's from the El Saman clan, which dominates many of the villages in that part. He was, is a peasant, he is illiterate, he is a Muslim, worked as a camel 
driver for a middle-class copt, and in his generation that was typical. The cops were the white collar and the Muslims were the physical laborers. I came back later the same day and I smashed the pot open. I broke it open exactly where I had found it. I thought there might be an evil spirit inside, a jinni. I had never seen anything like it before. I smashed the pot on my own and inside I found these old books. Then I brought the others over to see. They said, we don't want anything to do with these books. They belong to the Christians, the Copts. They said, it's nothing to do with us. It's amazingly beautiful. Some of the papyrus is so light that if you were to take a leaf on your hand and lower your hand, it would float through the air down. It is so light. When he got them home, he dumped them in the patio and his mother used some of the papyrus to heat the clay stove in the garden that they baked bread in. It was all just rubbish to us. Yes, my mother did burn some in the bread oven. Yes. Professor Robinson edited a special edition of the scholarly journal Biblical Archaeologist, devoted entirely to the Nag Hammadi find. For the first time, Muhammad Ali saw photographs of himself. That's me, Muhammad Ali Samman. And that is my mother. Mama. Mama. Your mother. That's where I found the books, on the Jabal, the mountain. One of the people from the village of Hamraddum killed my father. So it was decided that I should kill his murderer in revenge. I did kill him, and with my knife, I cut out his heart and ate it. I was in jail because of the killing. And when I got out of jail, I found that my mother had burned a lot of those old papers. Later on, I sold one book. All the others had gone. I got 11 Egyptian pounds for it. Professor Quispel's interpreter asked Muhammad Ali if he had any regrets about what happened when he found the books. No, I don't care. I don't give a damn about them. It doesn't even enter my head to think about it. Your discovery will change the mind of millions. So, I'm very pleased to meet you. Yes. One thing has become certain now for me, that is that these manuscripts, these beautiful manuscripts, were written somewhere here in one of the neighboring monasteries. I imagine that some monks who were living there in such a monastery felt uh, the pressure of the bishop, Bishop Athanasius, and then, at a certain moment, when it became too dangerous, they decided to hide these manuscripts. They didn't burn them, they didn't destroy them, they didn't tear them into pieces, but they simply hid them. The 
scriptures found at Nag Hammadi were written in Coptic, the vernacular language of Egypt, which was written in mostly Greek characters with an additional seven letters derived from Egyptian. It survives today among Egypt's Coptic Christian minority and in the Coptic churches. The present Coptic patriarch, His Holiness Pope Shenouda III, is the present-day successor to St. Mark, who founded the Coptic Church. The Coptic Church is the Egyptian Church. The word Copt and the word Egypt, the two are of the same root and the same origin. It was called also, through history, the Church of Alexandria, as Alexandria was the capital of Egypt at that time, at the beginning of Christianity. For centuries, Egypt was the crossroads of East and West, for scholarship as well as commerce. The major Greek seaport of Alexandria became a maritime stronghold of the Roman Empire, with an amphitheater and catacombs. Although Roman emperors persecuted Christians, Rome ultimately became the center of the growing Christian church. The Egyptian Gnostic author Valentinus traveled from Alexandria to Italy, where he almost became Bishop of Rome about 150 AD. Had he succeeded, the whole history of Christianity might have taken a radically different direction. The Valentinians, so far as we know from what they're, from, from what's left, uh, regarded faith as the essential first step in Christian life. The first thing a, a person does to become a Christian is to discover the faith in Jesus Christ, be baptized, have one's sins forgiven, join the Christian church. It's only after that that they would begin rather like some kind of secret theological circle would say, what do you really think it means that, say, Jesus died on the cross? Or what do you really think it means that, um, uh, that God created the world? They thought faith is the first step. Gnosis is, is the logical advancement of that. Facing persecution, the Christian church developed a hierarchy and began to define its canon of scripture and beliefs. There was grown an episcopacy, so-called monarchic episcopacy, a bishop, an authoritarian bishop, who could establish the faith of the creed and establish the canon of the Bible and had a, a say about everything. Bishops were empowered to investigate and denounce heresy wherever they found it. One of the most renowned heresy hunters far. was Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyon. You are the Bishop of Lyon. I am. My privilege to greet you. I am Narcissus, honored pupil of Valentinus. I am Irenaeus, pupil of Jesus Christ and of Polycarp, his servant, his witness. Irenaeus's book, Against the Heretics, is one of very You're few contemporary accounts of Gnostic me. beliefs which have survived. I write to expose the teachings of Valentinus as an entrapment, a snare for the faithful. Indeed. For Irenaeus and his fellow Christian bishops, Gnosticism was an automatic target. I wish to comprehend, to understand, why you are indifferent to the commands of your bishop and of the apostles. We revere, we love the apostles, in particular Paul, blessed Paul, who had perfect gnosis of the Saviour. As Christians were put to death in the arenas of the Roman Empire, the emerging church in Egypt, as in Rome and France, had to purge its divisive radicals. Heresy had to be condemned, even though the heretics believed themselves to be the true Christians. Yes, I have heard much of this claim. It is a claim to a secret teaching, is it not? After all, to be a Christian was to be a member of an illegal sect. One could be arrested and tortured and, and put to death either in public if one were not lucky enough to be a Roman citizen or simply beheaded if one had that good fortune. So the question when, when one belongs to a kind of persecuted movement like that is whether people are going to hold together when they're in danger. Were we all to become Gnostics, where would the church be? There could be no reliable witness before Caesar. One would say one thing and one another, and soon we would become all things to all men and not Christians at all. 
what Bishop Irenaeus did was try very hard to prove that Gnostics weren't really part of us. <laughs> he says, I know they say the same things we do, and they, they come to the creed, and, they, and they, they, they come to the to the services, and they say the same creed, and they look just like everybody else. But in fact, they're not. The Gnostic heresy included the use of feminine imagery to refer both to the Holy Spirit and to divine wisdom or the Holy Sophia. Gnostics also permitted women prophetesses, not because of feminism, but because the body was irrelevant when compared with the soul. Their enemies, by now becoming known as Orthodox or Catholic Christians, accused the Gnostics of being seducers. Part of their seduction techniques is to use feminine imagery for God. Another form that their seduction took was inviting women members of the Gnostics to participate in, for example, reading the scriptures, in prophecy, in speaking within the group in the way that men did as well. You see a struggle between the Gnostics and the Catholics for the place of womanhood in the church. In the primitive church, women could be prophetesses in office, that was an office of the church. And then the Gnostics accepted that. A, a woman could be a bishop, a woman could be a priest. She could celebrate the Eucharist. Why do you hold unauthorized assemblies? The church Why had reasons to be skeptical of the Gnostics. The Gnostics had abandoned the idea of the personal God of the Old Testament and had found within themselves the unknown God. And then they had the personal experience. We have discovered the truth of our freedom, freedom which the Savior has given us, freedom which we share with him. Why do you wish to enslave us again? No, Narcissus, I wish only to bring you to humility <laughs> and obedience to Christ, which is the very mark of a Christian. Humility. There is light within a man of light, and he lights up the whole world. If he does not shine, he is in darkness. So goes the Gospel of Thomas. Gospel of Thomas? There are only four Gospels. The whole church admits the four Gospels for very good reason. The four corners of the world, the four winds, the four covenants with the Lord. Only the Gnostics want more. Is there not enough for man's salvation in these? Personal religious experience was what mattered to them. Whereas for the Catholic Church, what, was matter, what mattered was obedience to the bishop. What are you so afraid of? Not of the Father, but the Demiurge, the Creator, who would make a husk out of the true Church, with rules for authorized assemblies and bishops who seek to destroy what they do not understand. Narcissus, the simplest man, understands Christ, but is baffled by Valentinus. The simple man is edified by love and understands humility. This is the true knowledge of the heart. Were you to continue, the church would collapse and this simple man would be denied the kingdom. Can you understand this, Narcissus? Can you understand this? I understand. You fear the freedom of the gospel which you preach. How long, I wonder, before it is not your brethren who are persecuted, but my brethren who are persecuted by you. And you, Narcissus, do you believe in God? Or like your namesake, only in yourself? Bishops like Irenaeus succeeded in driving the Gnostic heresy from the church wherever it was becoming organized, in Rome, Lyon, and the Christian centers within the Roman Empire. At the margins, however, Gnostic Christians remained for as much as 200 years. Nag Hammadi is some 500 miles south of Alexandria, where the Coptic church was founded. Scholars have concluded that the survival of the Gnostic texts is attributable to the extreme remoteness of the hiding place and the nearby presence of Coptic monasteries, never known before in the Christian church. The 
first monk in the world whose title is the father of all the monks, Saint Anthony, was a copt from Upper Egypt. Monasticism began at the end of the third century, but it began to flourish in the beginning of the fourth century. Saint Bachum began to gather groups of monks in one place, in one building, surrounded by a fence, giving every person a kind of work which may be suitable for him. And Saint Bachum, the first person who established monasteries and uh, put canons for monastic life, was also a, a copt from Upper Egypt. The Pacomian monastic order established itself here in the Upper Nile Valley. In the middle of the primitive village of Fau Kibli lie the ruins of what may be the original monastery of St. Pachom, just a few miles along the Nile from the cliffs where the codices were discovered. There must have been some Gnostic community nearby, and there is one reference in the life of Pacomius to debating with philosophers. One suspects those philosophers were more Gnostic than Aristotelian. Um, but we really don't know anything about that part of Egypt in, at that time, except for the Pacomian order. Dating tests on the bindings have established that the Nag Hammadi texts were bound into books around the year 350 AD, when the ruined monastery at Far Kibli was flourishing. The books were written at the end of the fourth century, by and large, based upon the trash paper used in the leather covers to thicken the bindings, since that trash papyrus tended to be business documents or letters with dates on them and places on them. And the dates tend to be down to about the middle of the fourth century and the places near Nag Hammadi. An Easter letter of Bishop Athanasius offers a possible explanation for the burial of the codices. The bishop did not merely define the teaching which was to be included in the canon of the church and thus in the Bible, but banned all the rest. Peftou en Evangelion. Menen sos te sente em prostimotheos. Awa te prostitos. Menen senai. Athanasius wrote a letter which the abbot of the order translated and read in all the monasteries, calling on the monasteries and the monks to get rid of heretical books, books falsely ascribed to patriarchs of the Bible and the like. And a number of our texts could fit such a description. Um, and so there must have been some kind of heresy alive in the monasteries, at least in their libraries. The monks' Gnostic scriptures were heretical, and their exclusion helped to define the approved scriptures in the shape of the Old and New Testaments, which we have inherited today. The offending material was to lie buried for almost 1,600 years after the monks at Fau Kibli concealed it. Not in order that we should find them, but that these holy scriptures that had a very special quality, an inherent holiness of quality, that these scriptures should not be destroyed. The physical burial and theological rejection of these Gnostic books was the result of their incompatibility with what had become the established doctrine and canon of what was now the church. Gnostics applied imagination and metaphor to the story of Christ and Christian faith. Gnosis created the heretical image of the laughing Jesus, mocking the very idea that crucifixion had touched him. I did not die in reality, but in appearance. My death, which they think happened, happened to them in their error and blindness, since they nailed their man unto their death. Yes, they saw me. They punished me. 
<laughs> it was not I. But I was rejoicing in the height over all the wealth of the Archons and of their offspring, of their error and their empty judgment. And I was laughing at their ignorance. <laughs> What the Gnostic alternative shares with the Orthodox Christian message, however, is the certainty of human disaster if the word that the living Jesus brings to man's attention should ultimately be ignored. Truly, I tell you that he who will listen to this word and turn away his face or smirk at it or sneer at these things, truly, I tell you, he will be handed over to the ruler above who rules over all the powers as their king. If he flees westward, he finds the fire. If he turns northward, he finds it there as well. If he turns southward, the threat of seething fire meets him there again, nor will he find his way to the east so as to flee there and be saved. For he did not find it in the day he was in the body, so he will not find it in the day of judgment. 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 The Gospels of Nag Hammadi are apocryphal Gospels, of course. They may uh, give an idea about uh, history, but uh, they are not considered by uh, the church in general. They're not regarded as genuine? No, 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 of course. The Christian canon has now been defined for 1,600 years. The 40 years since Nag Hammadi have seen little inclination towards change. The reaction of the present patriarch of the Coptic Church, Pope Shenouda, is typical. You see, at uh, the beginning of the Gospel of St. Luke, he said, as so many people began to write about the story of our Lord Jesus Christ, I wish to give you the exact facts. So many persons began to write from the very, very start of Christianity. But uh, writings of people is something, and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for holy books is another thing. Despite the rejection of the churches, the independent pulse beat of Gnostic tradition has survived suppression and attack. Professor Gillis Quispel, whose life as a scholar has been devoted to this ancient supplement to Christianity, argues that Gnosis still carries a spiritual message today. I think modern man can only accept what he experiences. And he can learn from the Gnostics that he can experience much more than he is aware of. And therefore I think that both for true believers and for unbelievers, Gnosis is very important because it will reveal to them an unknown dimension within themselves. That which you have within you will save you if you bring it forth from yourselves. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. Blessed are the solitary and elect, for you will find the kingdom. For you are from it, and to it you will return. Become passers-by. Hasten to be saved without being urged. Instead, be eager of your own accord. And if possible, arrive even before me. For thus the Father will love you. Drama, bloodshed, and military action punctuate the story of the French Cathars, Gnostic Christians who rejected the dogmas and authority of the Roman Catholic Church in the 12th and 13th centuries. The next program in this series recounts how the Cathar heresy, the heresy of the good men, was eliminated by the military power of the Catholic Church. A thousand years on, Cathars had no knowledge of the Egyptian texts, but the Gnostic impulse had inspired them too to seek the knowledge of the heart.